It's good for different things. So blood is great that we can actually look for DNA, but also uh, white blood cells, and then also the sera, which is a different part of the blood that doesn't contain DNA for a lot of metabolites um, from the liver. Uh, DNA from saliva is, is effective and efficient for us because it can travel in the mail, it can be st stored at room temperature, and it doesn't involve a needle stick or going to a lab, it's completely free of cost for the patient. Um, the blood in itself too is, uh, we, can, we can actually allocate into more samples, um, but again it's about asking different questions over time. So treatment, 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 and again it's identification of the disease, can be a very hard disease to, to, to diagnose. Ultimately there's not one screening test which makes our job a lot, lot harder. Many people go for years without a diagnosis but just abnormal liver tests. So ultimately it requires dedicated evaluation by probably a liver doctor or hepatologist. Um, so referrals are a great idea to look for clinical expertise and management issues. Now we can provide medications which are great. Um, they are immunosuppressant medications which usually include some form of prednisone but other some toxic medications to basically turn the volume down on the immune system. Unfortunately, these medications and the cells also have side effects too. No matter I, a goal of this disease to maybe get more individualized therapy, and I tell everyone this, is at least at this point in time, treatment in autoimmune hepatitis is similar to the hammer and nail. I'm the hammer and it's the nail. Again, hopefully with, with uh, research and understanding, we may be able to target things better uh, to minimize side effects and better patient outcomes. Yeah, so we don't use the word curable. I think in terms of uh, our, our profession and research, we want to call this disease curable, but just not yet. We are, our goal is really for the nomenclature of remission. And with remission, we describe this as complete blunting of the immune response that's driving the problem in the liver. Uh, with this, with medication, if your liver tests normalize within the first year, we think the overall survival is probably pretty good. However, some studies have said that maybe the survival still may be less um, versus someone that's in an age and gender matched population. Uh, flares in autoimmune hepatitis do happen. It's unclear what drives the flares. Medication compliance is always a big question. However, we know this really highlights the importance of understanding the environment that we live in. Um, so certainly even with liver disease, we've seen a lot of interesting things, everything from coffee uh, to smoking. These have not necessarily been identified in autoimmune hepatitis, but are there certain things that we're exposed to that may increase or decrease the threshold for disease flare? And certainly if flares do occur, they sometimes can be very challenging to get back under control. As of right now, we don't know. We have no large studies that have examined this. this is actually part of our research here, uh, at least using some novel platforms to assess this, including social media. We've actually identified breastfeeding may be a very important primer um, for the immune system. And we actually find that patients with autoimmune hepatitis tended to be breastfed less than their age and gender matched uh, co colleagues. So, is there something about breastfeeding that, uh, at least, or what we hypothesize, what breastfeeding may prime the immune system either through microbiota in the gut formation at a very early age, um, and therefore create somewhat of a rheostat or a uh, kind of threshold for the immune system in attacking self. And again, that's really the underlying key part of autoimmune hepatitis. There were no resources. And again, we'd like to think we're actually one of the first legitimate resources on the internet um, to provide information. Prior to this, people got their information from their physician. That information could have been great, it could have been poor. And again, you were left to kind of not know which one was which. Now with our group, people can actually take what their doctor's saying and compare what they've learned. And again, if they don't like those decisions or those comments, they can have an ongoing discussion. So I think we've really filled that unmet gap in education. I just think is so critical in a disease like this.